one in six of the world's population now is myopic. Uh, most of those reside, about a third of that number reside in Southeast Asia. Taiwan, for example, 80-90% of young adolescents there are myopic. I mean, that's unbelievable. So there's been really a, a refueling of the, of the debate on myopia um, and you know, an awful lot going on in terms of, of research. We've looked at aspects of accommodation, near work. Outdoor activity was, a, was a, a, a quite a big, a big issue. And we've moved on now to looking at structural aspects of the myopic eye. There's, there's plenty of evidence out there on, on um, family history studies. The nature versus nurture debate has, has roared away, you know, and, uh, because it leads on to treatment protocols, which is where we're at now. Um, because it's very, very clear from what's happened in the Far East, Southeast Asia particularly, that um, there is an environmental element to, to myopia prevalence. To that end, we've, um, the academic un universities here in, in the UK have formed a, a consortium, a UK myopia consortium, uh, to try and get some sort of critical mass to, to get strong research um, links between universities. Um, with a view to be able to get more funding for our research to, to try and find some, some cures for, for myopia progression. If we imagine the average vitreo retinal clinic at a hospital seeing patients that have had retinal detachment because of their, of their myopia, if we could see that now and the cost of that, I think that the, the, the sort of drive towards finding uh, a cure for, for myopia progression would be very much more at the forefront of the people funding healthcare. Atropine, if we look at the pharmaceutical method of treatment, is shown to work really rather well. Um, uh, this has been shown in countries like China principally, um, not so much in the West because of the ethical issues, because atropine will dilate a pupil, although they're using very low concentrations at the moment. Um, affect accommodation to a degree and there's potential systemic toxicity with atropine so all and you and it's going to be used in in children so that sort of adds to to the ethical issues and there's still uncertainty about exactly how atropine works does it work on the retina does it work on the sclera does it work possibly on the choroid and maybe some cascading of signals between those three things nobody really knows so i think that there there's another question mark about it you know it's nice to know how things work the multifocal um, contact lens uh, model is, is quite interesting actually and there's a lot of work being done um, in, in various labs and the, the idea being that you will have one set of um, focal lines from the, a distant uh, uh, object falling on the retina so the vision is, is, is clear but then you'll have uh, another set of focal lines in, imposed upon that from the effectively the near ad in the contact lens which would give the eye a constant level of, of myopic defocus. Now the thinking is there that that would give the eye a stop signal to actually uh, stop the eye from, from growing. And in fact the, the multifocal contact lens idea has now actually been combined with orthokeratology where they've actually combined those two things together. So you have a, uh, an orthokeratology lens that will alter corneal shape and it will do it in such a way that there is a, a, a multifocal shape on the front of the eye and that will give you um, these two different focal points within the eye and will hold back myopia progression. If we start to manipulate peripheral focus in the eye then we can manipulate how the central axial length grows. What's not clear at the moment is exactly how these treatment modalities that alter peripheral focus actually work. Um, there's a school of thought that says if you bring it all in front of the retina, make it relatively myopic, it will control myopia. But it may be the case that you need to actually tailor that shape to the shape of the retina. Um, and you know, um, as we proceed with this and get better methods of, of looking at the shape of the eye and more data points, uh, on a greater population of, of, of patients, then clearly that would give us some information. We need to be able to get into practice um, some methods of, of looking at um, not just the refraction, but the actual ocular biometry, so the length of the eye. We know that um, as the eye stretches, that's the primary 
sort of structural change that occurs in the progressing myopic eye. So for um, a practitioner to be able to monitor the effectiveness of any treatment they're giving um, a patient, they need not just the refraction but the biometry. So we really need to have equipment out there in practices to measure these things. Um, you know, spectacle refraction is okay, but because of the, the, the variability in the measurement, you won't really know if your procedure is working um, straight away. With biometry, it gives us a much finer measure, so we need that to be able to inform our choices for, for myopia control procedures. The companies are really supporting us in terms of, of, of lens design and there's lots of trials going on of, of, of contact lenses and spectacle lenses, so we will see how, how that comes out. And you know, the environmental aspect, the, you know, the, the artificial lighting type argument of my, myopia progression versus outdoor light as a, as a potential control, um, that is also very, very interesting. And again, over the next few years, I'm sure we will see some firm answers come out of this as to how we can help um, to control myopia progression.